So I'm from Los Alamos, uh, from Los Alamos National Laboratory. This is a collaboration with Joseph Kohler. And actually, uh, on the program, Joseph Kohler is the one that is supposed to talk. But as you all know, there's a wildfire over at Los Alamos. And um, the status is a little bit uh, iffy. Uh, so I was thrown into the mix and with only one or two hours to actually look at the slides, I'm going to try to explain them. So anyways, if I start running through the exit, don't be surprised because I'm not going to be, uh, I'm, I'm just not going to stop. Anyways, OK. So this is uh, the Radiation Belt Eddy Simulation Project that is being uh, developed at Los Alamos. Uh, it's a very exciting project because there's a lot of observations and we have a really interesting model which we are trying to actually improve. Um, uh, there is a, already a package that actually gives uh, good results, and there's already a website for this project that gives a nowcast of the, radi of the status of the phase space density of the radiation belts. Uh, you can find that at dream.lanl.gov, and it's actually quite interesting. Um, so here's an outline. Um, I think the data simulation has been ex explained quite well uh, in the previous two talks, but I'm going to actually just take a stab at it. Uh, we're going to talk about the application to radiation belts and its challenges, um, which is the radiation belt overview, uh, how we combine data with the model. And also a very important aspect is that we have to consider model errors or model deficiencies that can actually hinder quite significantly the results of data simulation. So there's a couple of, me well, there's one method that we're trying right now, which is called inflation. And I'm going to explain it as we go along. So the data simulation, let me just look at my cheat sheets. OK. Uh, so the, the data simulation in general, it's actually uh, how to combine information from the model observations and relevant statistics to actually give an improved model state. So. We so we have a physical system, uh, can be ocean, atmospheric, radiation belts, sun. I've also seen this applied to more electrical uh, problems, uh, mechanical and electrical problems. And, uh, and you can have uh, an observation set, right, of the physical system. Now, the, the basic problem in the simulation is to actually um, combine uh, model information and observation to get this improved uh, model state. Now, let's be very careful what we're saying about data simulation. Data simulation only improves the model state. It doesn't improve the model itself, OK? So it only tells you how to improve the model state. That's a very, very important key uh, issue. Uh, so we want to increase, actually, our knowledge by combining both data from both information from model and data. Um, and so as I already mentioned, data simulation uh, describes techniques that effectively combine model data and statistical, uh, and stati in a statistical correct way uh, using their uncertainties. Now here, uncertainties can be actually uh, variability or errors in model and observations. Uh, just a big overview. Uh, there are many techniques in data simulations. Uh, most of them have been mentioned. Uh, there's uh, common filtering techniques, variational methods, ensemble-based methods, which include the ensemble common filter, Gaussian mixture filter methods, and also particle filtering, and hybrids between variational and all of these ensemble-based methods. Um, let me see. The main motivation for us is we want to actually use all information from models and data to increase our physical understanding of the uh, physical phenomena that you are observing or that you're interested. So this is how actually we can see the schematics. We have observations. We have physical model. This information is fed into some kind of uh, data simulation method, which can be common filtering. And then we're going to have an assimilated state that actually gives you a good forecast, give you estimates, gives you parameters, and also provides uncertainties. OK? So it's very, very interesting. Uh, a little bit of a background. Here we're going to talk about uh, more ensemble-based methods, and uh, specifically 
the ensemble kind, common filter-based methods. So uh, one of the main contributors uh, for this uh, uh, kind of Gaussian um, uh, theory was actually Carl Friedrich Gauss. Um, he actually worked on a lot of, lot of things um, uh, in astronomical, uh, I'm sorry, uh, what is that? I don't know what this is. Thera motus corporatus celestium. I think it's something about celestial bodies. Uh, so Gauss actually determined orbits uh, of comets from incomplete astronomical data and Newtonian mechanics. And he used this by a least square method, very simple method where we, you actually uh, minimize the distance between observation and model through a least square sense. Uh, early attempts of weather forecasting actually are based on these methods. And the key ideas are the following. All model and observations are approximate. In other words, you have an approximate model. And even if your model is approximated, you're approximating the solution of the model through a numerical method, right? So you're not, you're not even solving your model exactly. Uh, observations are also approximate. Why? Because you have measurement error. You have also interpretation error. So you have these uh, uncertainties in both information sources, model and observations. Uh, the resulting analysis will also be only an approximation. But what you want to do is actually improve that approximation as much as possible. Uh, so the observations and model ha have to be optimal combined. Uh, the model is only used as a preliminary state, right? So the final estimate should fit observations with observational error, okay? In other words, you have to be close enough to the observations if you trust those observations a lot. Now, the principle in data simulation, as I, as I is, or it's, has already been stated, uh, it's to estimate uh, an optimal, optimal state of the system uh, through information of model and observations. How can we combine data, right? So we can actually use a my, my maximum likelihood estimate and use also Bayesian statistics as well as least squares methods. Now a very nice schematic is right here. So we want, we want to estimate an improved state X given information from let's say model and observations. And one of the main assumptions behind most methods is that the observation and model errors are actually Gaussian. So you can actually describe them with two moments. The first of them is going to be the mean, and the second one is going to be the variance or covariance, right? So that simplifies the problem quite considerably. And uh, a nice schematic of how that works is uh, th through this conditional probability saying, well, if I, if, if I have information from observations and model, and I want to do an estimation of x, we can use some kind of bias uh, uh, theorem or bias theory and get an improved state. Now, one of the first things that you can notice here is that the variance of this improved state, well, we would like it to be small, okay? In other words, we would like to have high, conf uh, um, high confidence in this new improved state. Uh, so even if you have a very, let me see, even poor quality data can give you some information, right? And, um, but it will receive a small weight. In other words, you have to weight it correctly. Now, we, big schematics of what data simulation methods are uh, is right here. Uh, of course, it's quite a mess. Uh, but let's, uh, the main points uh, are the variational methods that are right here, the 3D var and 4D var that, that were developed in the, around the 90s. Uh, the uh, optimal interpolation, the extended Kalman filter, which then got to the Kalman, Kalman smoother and fixed lag Kalman smoother, very, very, uh, variations of the uh, Kalman filtering technique. Um, but basically the historic overview is that is the following. First we have a successive correction. In other words, we correct our model through our observations successively. Then in 1768, we had optimal interpolation. That was the thing in that time. Uh, around the 90s, we have a 3D var, which is minimizing a cost function, as was explained earlier. In the late 90s, there was a 4D var, which is very popular in European centers. Uh, but all assimilation techniques actually differ uh, in computational cost, in ease of an implementation, and suitability for real-time assimilation. Uh, the variational methods have the advantage that 
uh, in the case of 4D VAR, it can give you a smooth time distributed solution to the observations. It's a very, very good thing to, to have. And it has been shown that it gives you a really nice solution that doesn't have any chocks, at least in the, in, in the time uh, variation, variation sense. And uh, it actually approximates the observations quite well. Uh, the disadvantage of the variational methods is that you're going to have to uh, develop uh, derivatives of your code, either tangent and adjoint, and that's very time consuming and actually very hard. So uh, the other methods are actually ensemble based methods that are very simple to implement and it can be implemented to any model whatsoever. The disadvantage is that uh, unless you have an ensemble smoother, which is very expensive, your solution will have kind of like discontinuities in a time distributed sense. And also, um, they're not as exact as 4D VAR, although they are getting there, okay? Um, additionally, the ensemble methods, you're gonna have this additional computational cost of simulating multiple ensembles of your system to get relevant model statistics. So anyways, a good paper for this type of uh, overview is this uh, Boutier and Courier uh, in 1999, which is from the ECMWF Center. You can actually go to the website, website and find that paper. Very, very good paper. Um, so the particular method that we're going to talk about is a common filter, the ensemble common filter. And uh, first, let's look at the linear common filter algorithm, which is the following. Uh, let's suppose you have an initial state. Uh, you put it through a model. The model gives you a prediction. And you also, let's suppose, that somehow you get your um, covariance matrix. That covari this information then is fed to the uh, simulation, which combines information from the observations y and the uh, observations from your previous state estimate and also statistics to get an improved state and Im an improved or updated model covariance matrix, right? So this is the assimilated state. Then use this guy again in here in the prediction, make a forecast and put it back into the simulation. So you have this cycle where we have correction, prediction, correction, prediction, correction, prediction, up until you have a forecast. Now, the good thing here in, in this is that this method, the linear common filter theory, works really nice with linear models, small linear models. But as soon as you have some nonlinear models, this thing breaks down. So you cannot use it as effectively. Uh, an alternative for nonlinear models in the common filter is the extended common filter. Now, the extended common filter works really well for nonlinear models, but small nonlinear models. Okay? Once you get into thousands or millions of variables in your model, the extended common filter becomes very expensive because you have to actually evolve this covariance matrix in time. That becomes computationally infeasible. So what's the next step? In 1994, a guy called Ebenson, which is actually in, in Europe, uh, developed this ensemble common filter where he used a Monte Carlo approach to estimate the covariance matrix through an ensemble of model states. And that took care of this very exp expensive computation of evolving the model covariance matrix to the model. In other words, you use, you use this ensemble of model space and you estimate or you approximate your covariance matrix. Um, let me see. So it's very nice to, uh, it fully non, uh, it's a full nonlinear integration contrary to the extended common filter, which is non, it's still linear. The extended common filter is still a linear evolution of the covariance matrix. Um, okay. So how does the covariance matrix look like? Well, it's very simple. It's a very simple approximation, which everybody knows. It's just each ensemble member minus the uh, average, and then do this out of product which is going to give you a matrix. Now, one, of, one main thing that you have to notice is that since you have only a finite size ensemble, this approximation may be not optimal, okay? There's various issues with that. And you will notice that, that as you actually implement these uh, ensemble-based methods, the most important thing in that ensemble-based methods is actually this approximation that the approximation of the covariance matrix. So you have a very faulty covariance matrix. Let's suppose you have a system that is 30 million in size, and you only have 30 ensemble members. Chances are is that your covariance matrix is not going to be very accurate. It's going to contain various uh, deficiencies. So you have to be very careful 
uh, about your ensemble size. You have to be very careful about your ensemble spread. You have to be very careful how much you're going to trust that covariance matrix, and probably you're going to have to actually modify it. So well, probably I said more than enough. Uh, uh, OK, so the ensemble mean, which is uh, this phi, ra, phi bar, is the best guess of the actual state of the system. So what we're doing here is saying, OK, we have two moments. We have the mean, we have the covariance. The ensemble mean is going to give you the best estimate, and the covariance is going to give you the uncertainty in that best estimate. Um, OK. As we said here, uh, covariance matrix can be represented by an ensemble model state, and it's not, it doesn't have to be unique. So the application that we have here in Los Alamos is this radiation belt, right? So we have, uh, so we have an, uh, I'm going to talk about an exam example of applying the ensemble common filter to radiation belt and modeling. Now you're gonna have to uh, uh, forgive me, because, but um, I'm really a little bit more of an expert of data simulation, not so much of radiation belts. So if I say a lie or something like that, just call me and say that's not true or you're wrong. You know, just. Uh, be, be patient with me. Uh, so this, these radiation beds were discovered accidentally in 1958 by Dr. Van, what? Van Allens. Uh, it was a ray experiment that he did on board of this spacecraft, Explorer 1. They saw these, this behavior and they said, ah, well, these are trapped electrons in this magnetic field, in Earth uh, magnetic field. Um, the energies are bigger than 0.1, MEV, I really don't know what that is. Um, the inner radiation belt is going to be from 1.3 to 3 RE. Outer belt is going to be from 3 to 10. Uh, the slot region is, has a flux minimum near 3 RE. And the radiation belt el electrons are actually el rel rel relativistic electrons. Now, there are very various changes in fluxes in the radiation belts when you actually start to observe these things. Sometimes you have really nice form radiation belts. This is a time distributed picture of, of the phase space density of the radiation belt. So sometimes you have really nice formed radiation belts and sometimes they disappear. So we really don't know what's going on or why that is. So there are various um, processes going on in radiation belts and bonding, acceleration, transport, uh, loss of mechanics, and are not well, and these are not well understood. So traditional theories have broken down on the new observations. In other words, until we start observing, we said, well, you know what? This is maybe not valid. We have to actually update these theories. One tool to update those theories is through data simulation. But let's be careful. Data simulation only gives you an improved model state, OK? Let's just be careful about that. So in response to this problem, uh, Lionel actually developed this. Uh, this is not the only radiation belt uh, project. Let me just be clear with that. So Lano developed this uh, the dynamic radiation environment assimilation model. Okay. So it actually has uh, a nice uh, coupling between model observations, uh, data simulation, statistics. So it's a really big model, very interesting to work on, and it's very uh, um, interdisciplinary because you have people from, from all over the place, from mathematics to physics to people that are actually. Uh, managing the instruments, people that are processing the observations, that are processing the data. So it's very interdisciplinary and very interesting. Um, so it, it was developed by Lionel to quantify risks from natural and artificial radiation belts. Uh, and it uses data simulation with observations from geo, GPS, and other uh, satellites. So it couples a ring current, a magnetic field, and a radiation belt models. And its goal is the specification, prediction, and understanding of radiation belts, and probably in the near future, actually forecast. So now, right now, we have a now cast, but we will actually, actually uh, move, would like to move to forecast. The whole computational framework is the following. You have various uh, elements in here. You have the radiation belt observations. You have the global magnetic field model. Um, you have usual requirements, what is it that you want to get out of the system, uh, physics-based radiation belt models, and in the core you have this radiation belt data simulation, right? And the part that uh, we're actually working on most, most is this, the data simulation engine. How to actually make that engine work with all these uh, different parts and give you a good uh, product, which is the environmental connection condition 
forecast, warnings, statistical assessment, et cetera, whatever the client wants to actually get from this. Now, right now in our dream project, we have a, uh, uh, has the following simple physical model. It's actually a one dimensional radio diffusion model described right here, where S is the source term, uh, DL is the diffusion coefficient, uh, and F is actually phase space density. Uh, that is a function of the three invariant, um, three invariant variables, right? Which is the gyration, bounce motion, and drift motion. Uh, the diffusion uh, coefficient is modeled after this uh, paper from Brodigam and Albert in 2000. It has this following expression. And the loss inside, and losses inside the pl plasma sphere, which is, uh, we took the work from Carpenter and Anderson in 1992, is given by this index LPT. Um, let's see. So uh, it's, it's a model for phase space density, and it gets data from three, LANL, uh, from three satellites, which is the LANL Geo, Polar, and GPS NSF-41. It uses an ensemble common filter with augmented state vectors for parameters. Let's remember that in the ensemble common filter or in any other data simulation methods, you can actually estimate the parameters by attaching them to the model state vector. Um, okay, now, our data simulation, well, this is, this is almost the same. No, that's not correct. So what can data simulation do? Well, it actually can give you a, if you cannot give a forecast, you can actually get a really good now cast. Now, and the problem with the observations is that uh, observations are in flux form. They're actually count rates of how much electrons you have in your instrument. But what, what we would like to have is actually a whole Phase space density of the radiation belts. So when this transformation of the observations from flux form to phase space density uh, takes place, we have this data set, which is really, really sparse, right? So you have big holes in here. This is a data set with those three different satellites. And you can see that you, know, you have a la very uh, a not, a not well covered system, right? So you have to actually fill those voids. And you don't want to just put stuff in those voids. You actually have to estimate the best state to complete the state on those uh, 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 of this physical problem. So when you do data simulation to actually fit to actually fit the observations, sorry, to fit the observations with the model, you have this uh, result, and this is with our ensemble common filter. Here in the white, we see the actual observations, and the rest of it is actually the model and the data simulation trying to estimate the best state of the system. So we have a better uh, idea of what the whole system looks like instead of just you know random holes in there. Okay. Now, all of these carries uncertainty, but also there is uh, a problem, which is uh, we don't have a complete model. Our model may be incomplete or may have model errors that are very over, that are overwhelming the data simulation. So Kohler uh, et al. at 2007 uh, developed this residual method where they used the data simulation to estimate missing source terms in this one dimensional radial diffusion problem. Um, he calculated, the, you know, uh, compared the forecast with the observations and calculated the innovation vector, which is this quantity that was mentioned in the two previous uh, talks, uh, which is the observations minus the state of the system. And this is a function of L star, and it actually uh, gives you the model and data of uncertainties. Now, the residuals in this paper, the residuals were used to identify model drift, where the model is actually drifting away from the observations and corrected. Um, so, we did a twin experiment, and in the twin experiment, what we do is say, okay, let's see if in theory we can do this right. We're going to try to identify where the model is drifting and try to correct it. So what we did in here is we actually took our 1D diffusion problem, put an artificial uh, source term into it, and just simulated and got this solution right here. And here you can have high activity, low activity, okay? 
So we said, OK, let's assume that this is our observations. But now, our observations are not complete. They have really big voids. So let's just you know, eliminate a lot, of, a lot of this true state or observation state and have this. This are going to be our observations. Now, based on this data and our model, can we recuperate the original state, this guy? And we had the following results using ensemble data simulation. We had the following results. Here we have the true state, the same state as before, but now we have the assimilated state, and we see, well, you know what? It's, it's not completely perfect, but it's actually pretty good, okay? So this technique of identifying where our model is drifting away actually works, because now we can identify where the model is drifting, correct it, and get an improved state in here, okay? Um, okay. Here's a more schematic of how, the, how we identify where the model was drifting. Uh, so we used an average residual of ensemble states to point to a drifting physics model where forecasts are inconsistent with data, okay? Now this helped us identify missing physics in the model, okay? So here what we, what we have is the actual innovation or difference between the observations and the model. And here we can see that in here, Okay, we have good agreement between the model and observations, but suddenly in this region in here, we have really bad agreement. So we know that in this region, there was something going on in our observations and our model started to drift away from the observations, meaning that the error, the model error was dominating right here, okay? So using this information, we corrected our one-dimensional one diffusion model and said, well, we have to correct it right now because this is where we have drift, okay? Okay, I'm almost done. Um, so the challenge is to, is to actually accurately estimate the error, okay? So the, for the 1D diffusion, uh, we can use uh, conjunctions, okay? And the model errors, we have to, uh, we can use the residual between model forecast and observations. In other words, say, well, if this is uh, how much is drifting, we know that there's a significant model error and we have to correct it. Uh, okay. So what, one thing that we said, okay, what if we don't want to use drifting? What if we don't want to use this innovation? Can we actually improve our model state? And yes, we can. Uh, we'll, we use something called the ensemble inflation, where we said, well, okay, if the model is drifting, I'm going to accept that, but can I correct the ensemble, the whole ensemble, to give me a corrected state, okay? So that's the whole purpose of this ensemble inflation. So here on the right, we have this uh, observations. Again, uh, the same set of observations, only with a different time frame, okay? And here we have the actual solution of the model, and as you can see, the model actually kind of dies down without the appropriate source term and, you know, goes to zero. So what we said, okay, what if we assimilate, just assimilate, do not do any model inflation, just assimilate, see what you get. Well, when we assimilate, the model error is so dominant that even if with assimilation, we don't get the correct solution, okay? In other words, the model errors are dominating the solution and making the, the, the data simulation not, making the data simulation not being able to correct this estimate. Now, once we tried inflation, which is say, okay, the model is incorrect, we have to add some noise into it to, act, to actually correct it, we got the following solution. And we can see a dramatic difference between the solu this solution and the previous one. Now we have a really good agreement with the observations and we actually have good dynamics in the model. So I'm just gonna talk about the sum summary. Uh, so the DREAM uh, project is a data simulation framework that uses ensemble common filter for the radiation belt assimilation and research. Uh, it also has to uh, do the solo magnetos. It also can do the solo magnetogram assimilation. And this is a joint project with, with LANL and AFORS. The challenges is watch out for accurate error description for data and model. And if the model is very wrong, like the 1D uh, radiation belt diffusion model, without acceleration terms or special time varying boundary conditions, their error and inflation method might be quite appropriate. So uh, there's this 
uh, to end, there's this uh, package, which is in, which is in spaceparry.lanl.gov, that actually gives most of the solutions. And you can actually play around with this. So anyway, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>